Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala and today we are going to go over CDHs or congenital diaphragmatic hernias. Before we start, I want to give a massive thank you to Dr. Chandra Sekharan, who is at the University of Buffalo, as well as Dr. Satyan Lakshman Rusimha, who is at UC Davis. They wrote and illustrated an absolutely beautiful review on congenital diaphragmatic hernias, and very generously they agreed for us to actually go over this material and use their beautifully drawn images in this video. So thank you so much. Before we start, let's imagine this scenario. A friend or relative of yours, a woman and her husband, call you up and they're asking you for advice. I know that this happens to everybody because we work in medicine. The woman is pregnant and just went for her 20 week ultrasound and she was told that the fetus has a CDH or a congenital diaphragmatic hernia and they are absolutely terrified and they have lots and lots of questions for you. Is the baby going to survive? How long is the baby going to be in the hospital? Is the baby going to need an operation? What does it actually mean that the intestines are in the chest? So what do you say? Well, the truth is to offer them any sort of helpful advice, you have a bunch of questions for them too. So this is kind of what we're going to be covering in the coming two videos. In this first video, we'll cover what CDH is, as well as good and bad prognostic factors for CDH. And in the next video, we'll cover how we manage CDH, as well as outcomes after CDH. So pretty much if you watch these two videos, you'll know everything that your relatives or friends need to know. So let's start with one, what is CDH? CDH stands for congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Congenital, because babies are born with it. Diaphragmatic, because the actual initial defect is in the diaphragm. There is a hole in the diaphragm. And hernia, because it's allowed some of the organs to herniate into another part of the body where they're not supposed to be. Right, let's talk more about the diaphragm because it is really important that you understand this point. And I have this great model, I mean, no expenses spared in this video, which demonstrates basically where the diaphragm is. So as you all know, the diaphragm is the muscle that separates the belly from the chest. So again, the lungs, the diaphragm, this is the liver here on the right side, and this is the stomach here on the left side, and then the rest of the intestines. So sometimes during development, the diaphragm is not completely made normally. So sometimes there is a hole in that diaphragm, in that muscle, which allows abdominal contents to go up through that hole and then spread into the chest. So you can end up with a whole bunch of the abdominal contents, so the stomach, the intestines, sometimes the liver, which isn't great, going up through the hole in the diaphragm into the chest. As you all know, these are also pretty easy to recognize on chest x-rays because what you see is a whole bunch of intestines actually where the lungs should be. This is a huge issue because when the abdominal contents, the stomach and the intestines or whatever, go up into the chest, it inhibits the development of the lungs on that side and often on the other side as well. So it's not like, oh, doesn't matter, we can just do surgery, we'll pull the intestines back down again and close the diaphragm and everything will be okay. That's not the case at all because the issue is, is just the intestines being up there stops the lungs from developing as they should. So. As you would imagine, the lungs on the actual side of the defect would be severely affected. So say you have the hole on the left side of the diaphragm, so the left lung would be severely affected. And that has been shown over and over again that the bronchioles and the vessels are actually dividing and branching out at a much lower rate. So that lung ends up with way fewer air sacs. So that whole lung on that left side is basically hypoplastic or underformed. But unfortunately, that's not just it. Very often the lung on the other side of the defect is also affected. It could be because the same factors are triggering that decreased branching in the lungs on the right side, or it could also be just a physical effect. 
If there's a bunch of lungs on the left side, then the whole mediastinum and chest and heart and everything is pushed over to the right side and therefore you end up with decreased formation of those lungs too. On top of all of this, the actual heart can be affected as well, probably also because of like the physical trauma from being pushed over. So this can also end up with severe dysfunction of the heart. So in summary, CDH is not just really bad because of the intestines actually being in the chest, but because of the severe underdevelopment of the lungs and often because of dysfunction of the heart as well. Now let's go over some facts about CDH because you've all told us that you like to know these. CDH occurs in about one to five out of 10,000 births. So it's actually really rare. That number seems so low if you've ever worked in a level four NICU. And it is slightly more common in boys than it is in girls. Like just about everything else that goes wrong in embryology, we don't really know exactly what causes CDH. It's just really bad luck in the formation or maybe some cross section of bad luck and bad genes. There is a mouse model of CDH where it's been shown that a type of herbicide, if administered to pregnant mothers, can result in the tiny fetuses of the mice developing CDHs. So obviously there can be some sort of environmental toxin that can increase the incidence of a CDH. Most of the time, CDH is an isolated disease, but it can also be associated with other anomalies. For example, anomalies in the gastrointestinal tract, in the cardiac system that we've already talked about, in the GU system, so the genitourinary, so you can have abnormalities with the bladder and the kidneys as well. It can also be associated with other genetic anomalies, so trisomy 13, 18, and 21, as well as a whole bunch of other genetic syndromes. So obviously, going back to one of the questions that you'd be asking your friend, you would want to make sure that there aren't any other anomalies involved or the baby doesn't have the CDH as part of a genetic anomaly. So this is very much part of the testing after it has been found that a baby does have CDH. The defect in the diaphragm and a congenital diaphragmatic hernia can be pretty much all over the diaphragm. I took the little diaphragm out from my model. So the most common one is a posterior lateral type of CDH. So behind, towards the back and then lateral to the outside of the body, not the inside of the body. This is called a Bogdalek hernia. This is different from a Morgagni hernia, which is more medial. This one kind of has a Morgagni hernia, this model, because the screws all need to be there. But the medial hernias are generally not as bad. And again, this is because the Bogdalek hernias normally allow more of the intestinal contents and the stomach and everything to go up into the chest as compared to the Morgagni hernias. Normally, when we're discussing CDHs, we're really referring to Bogdalek hernias. We'll very much say specifically, oh, this baby has a Morgagni hernia, rather than calling it a CDH. And about 85% of Bogdalek hernias happen on the left side. So the left side is way more common for a CDH than the right. Right, let's move on to number two. So now you know kind of what a CDH is, let's talk about good and bad prognostic factors for a CDH. With all comers included, the survival rate of CDH is about 70%. Some centers are reporting higher numbers than this, up to about 90% survival. What's encouraging is that all of the survival numbers have been improving. And just as kind of a caveat for those centers that are reporting a much higher survival rate, you also have to take into account, is it exactly the same type of baby that is being treated at those centers? For example, if all the bad CDHs that are being diagnosed prenatally, if the parents are choosing to terminate them, then obviously it's the healthier babies that are actually being treated. Or is it because in those centers they happen to have healthier babies? So just always take that into account when you're looking at the percentage survival in different centers. But wherever the center is, there are prognostic factors that are associated with worse outcomes. And that's what we're gonna go over now. The first one is if the infant has any other associated anomalies. So you have to ask your friend, 
Was genetic testing done? Does the baby have any other genetic anomalies? Is the rest of the anatomy scan normal? Are there any abnormalities with the GI system or the kidneys or anything else going on? Does the heart look normal? This is a very important prognostic factor. Is the heart anatomically normal? Is it functioning well or as well as you can see on the prenatal ultrasound? Obviously, with any anomalies, especially with the genetic abnormalities, then the chance of survival goes down. The second bad prognostic factor would be severe lung hypoplasia. Obviously, the smaller the lungs and the worse they developed, the worse the outcome is going to be. However, you can't really tell exactly how developed the lungs are prenatally. So what can we actually do? What we'd really like to be able to do is measure exactly how big the lungs are. Obviously, this is hard, especially with the lung on the affected side, because like those intestines could kind of be coming in and out. And it's difficult to have an idea of exactly how big the lungs are. So one of the measurements that is done that it's kind of used pretty frequently is measuring the size of the contralateral lung. So the lung that is not affected with the defect and then comparing it to the size of the head of the fetus. So what you end up with is something called the LHR, the lung head ratio. Obviously, the bigger the lungs, the higher the LHR and the better prognosis for the infant. An LHR of above 1.35 is considered to have a very good prognosis. And an LHR of less than 0.6 is considered abysmal. In fact, one study showed that it's associated with zero survivors. I'm sure everybody watching this can see the inherent issues with this. Obviously, you're getting the ultrasound at one time and the ultrasound itself is also operator dependent. So a few millimeters here or there could really throw those numbers off. Also, the LHR would depend on the gestational age of the baby. The lungs in utero expand at a much higher rate than the head does. So obviously, the older the baby, the bigger that we would expect the LHR ratio to be. So a whole new set of values was proposed where the gestational age was taken into account. And basically this is calculated as an observed over expected LHR for gestational age. And this table kind of sums up all of these. So going back to your friend, make sure that you ask your friend, was an LHR ever calculated? Number three, another prognostic factor is at what age the CDH was diagnosed. Obviously, the defect in the diaphragm is formed or not formed actually in the first trimester. So like less than 12 weeks. Obviously, the amount of intestinal contents that go up into the chest is going to determine how poorly the lungs are formed. So if that hole is actually really small, which you can't tell on the ultrasound at all, you can't really tell until the surgeons go in and look at it and try to fix it. But if that is small, then less stuff is going to go up into the chest. That's not a prognostic factor because we don't know how big it is. But also there's a possibility that there's something that's kind of causing a barrier above that hole or below it that's kind of preventing the intestines and whatever else from going through into the chest. So maybe the liver acts as a tamponade, maybe the stomach or just like a thick membrane or something is literally stopping the intestines and everything from going through. If that is the case, then generally those babies are going to do a lot better. So it's possible that if even if there's a hole and there's a barrier there, that if the mother gets an ultrasound at 20 weeks, it's possible that the baby does have a CDH, but we don't have anything in the chest, so it's not caught. So sometimes these mothers get an ultrasound at 36 weeks for whatever reason, and suddenly they see a CDH. By the mere fact that the intestines weren't all in the chest, all the way through the pregnancy, this is hopefully going to be a much better prognostic factor. We've also all had those babies that have delivered and they're in respiratory distress and we get a chest x-ray and wow, it's a CDH on the chest x-ray. Obviously, if the mother didn't have any prenatal care, then we don't know how long those intestines have been in the chest for. 
But if the mother did get good prenatal care all the way through pregnancy, maybe got a couple of ultrasounds, then we can be a lot more confident about the outcome of that baby as compared to a baby that's had intestines in the chest since like 20 weeks. Obviously, in the case of your friend that we've been talking about, the intestines were in the chest at 20 weeks of gestation. So that doesn't really affect the prognostic factor one way or another at that point. And the fourth extremely important prognostic factor prenatally is whether there is liver in the chest. So as we talked about, the vast majority of CDHs are on the left side and the liver is on the right side. Let me grab my little thing again. So here we have the liver on the right side. And like I said, the vast majority are on the left side. So having the liver in the chest might just be a marker of a really big, bad CDH. If the liver is down in the belly, then survival is reported at between 74 to 100%. And if the liver has been seen in the chest, then the survival is somewhere between 45 and 56%. So huge different in prognostic factors. So one of the most important questions that you have for your friend is, where is the liver? Is it in the chest or is it in the belly? And that is the end of part one. If you like this video, then please actually like it on YouTube and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in neonatal content. If you are going to send us a comment, please let us know where you're from. We love hearing from where everywhere in the world everybody is from. Anyway, thank you all so much for being here.